Hi, Adam. Hey, Tyler. Super good to be here. Nice to meet you again. Oh, man, this is really great. So for anybody that doesn't know Adam Lissagor, Adam is like the, the character actor that you love all his movies, but you didn't realize just how many he was in. Uh, you kind of have put your fingerprints all across uh, internet history and TV history and I have been your fan for a very long time, so this is this is a big moment for me. I'm very excited to to chat with you in in a recording. I'm honored and excited to be here. I'm just um, sort of uh, surprised and taken aback when anybody knows my work at all. So the doubly so when I come across somebody like yourself on the internet, I'm like, oh, that guy's interesting. He makes really good stuff. I wonder <laughs> if he's ever heard of my what I do. Cause I make video too. I bet that's very impressive. And then, and then suddenly it turns out you already know who I, I I've said before on the show that I think the best part about creating internet content is, I mean, actually I say this almost every show cause it's just my favorite thing is that when you create something online, you can make these really fast friendships where it's like, well, we didn't know anything, but now all of a sudden we know all this stuff in common, but I don't know. I'm not going to tread that, that ground a million times, but for anybody who isn't familiar with your work. I first know you from You Look Nice Today, which is a, uh, I kind of think of it like, it's like the pixies of podcasts where all the podcast, like, not everybody <laughs> knows about it now, but all the podcasters out there today have heard your show and got inspired to start theirs because of it. Which, um, what year, like what years were those? When did that happen? Gosh, I think it was 2009, maybe we started it. And because we celebrated a 10 year anniversary of course, somebody mentioned on Twitter, but it was like during a deep, deep um, downtime between between recording. We just recently started up again, as you know. Um, but you know, it, it's it's like I don't know. It's like a band. It really is where we'll, we we will just be each other's best friends and confidants for a number of years, and and every conversation ends with "Okay, I love you guys," <laughs> and you know, like you know each other intimately. And then things happen and it just like people disperse, disband and go their separate ways. And, but you discover years later, oh, the love is still there. It never went anywhere. Uh, so you sort of come back to do it all again because you remember how good it I'm feels. I'm so glad to have it back. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm glad you're having fun doing it. What do, what do most people know you for? I mean, like what, if you just, uh, you know, go up to someone on the street and say, do you recognize me? What, why might they? Like, wh where do other people know you from? <laughs> number one how arrogant and rude of me to go up to somebody <laughs> on the street and ask them okay, that question yeah. but usually what they say is no i'm just kidding uh i don't know like it depends really depends on the context it, it, it early on i became known in the de designer developer apple nerd boy community nerd mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. community uh and so in that context i'm known as like you know, being early on, like, uh, getting obsessed with Apple stuff and being on John Gruber's show and, uh, you know, like you look nice today. There's a lot of overlap with, with that community. Um, and then eventually doing my own app birdhouse and then like parlaying that into a video company. So that's kind of what I, where I'm known there probably later on in the, in, in the advertising community, I I'm sort of known as starting my shop sandwich or what used to be sandwich video. We sort of lopped off the, uh, the video part last year when we rebranded and the sort of peak of my exposure in that world was in, I think 2015, I was spokesperson in two national campaigns on, on broadcast TV. I I was the true car guy for like four years, I think. And then that year, 2015, I was uh CenturyLink. I was like also spokesperson for CenturyLink, which is this telecom company, not here in LA where I live, but in various other markets in the States. And that was sort of like too much exposure. That was like, oh, that guy who does that thing, the startup, startup bearded, you know, startup mm -hmm. guy thing that makes videos. Um, he does that thing. Oh, now he's on TV. That's weird. Oh, now he's all over TV. That's <laughs> weird. Okay. Like I don't, you know, just, like, too much. Right. And there was like a lot of years where people would just say, Oh, I saw you on a sports bar. Oh, I saw you on TV at my grandma's house. Oh, I, you know, I saw you at the gym. I was always at the gym. Um, so that's probably the numbers wise, sheer numbers. 
that's where people probably knew me most when the most people knew. Well, leading up to talking to you today, what it, I realized is you're this very strange proto influencer. Like you're not, I mean, you're not, so, <laughs> I, you know, I sort of do what people think of right now as like influencer jobs sometimes, you know, where it's like, I have a, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a pitch, I'm pitching a product and you, you know, that this is a sponsored <laughs> video. Cause I'm going to, I'm going to say so. And it's a very, it's very different now, but you were doing I, like, I don't, there's some, there's some parallel I'm seeing here, right? Like I'm not crazy. You, you're, you're, you're a, a spokesperson, no. more of like a traditional pitch man employed by the company, creating the content yourself and with your agency, but it's so different from what everybody else right. is doing now. Like you're sort of the, the only person I can think of doing this type of work or doing it in this format. Yeah. I think I'm still maybe the only person that did, is like, like you said, I, I run the agency and also I'm often in camera doing the one presenting. So I'm doing the sort of the, uh, spokesperson slash influencer job, but also it, the, I'm the head of the studio that sort of creates and shapes the, the content in, in my prior life before sandwich, before I started sandwich, I remember there being rumors that, uh, the, that the clown in the Jack in the box commercials was actually the head of the agency, like the founder of the agency that d did that work and the chief creative, um, creative director. I don't know whether that's true, but I've always just believed it. And I think that it's sort of an anomaly in the ad world to have an agent, like the head of an agency be the talent. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen so often anymore, but it was definitely a thing then. Um, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like ever the hottest ticket or like the, the coolest story in every ad trade publication. Cause it, the end of the day, it was still just explainer style spokes spokesperson type videos, which isn't the coolest thing ever. It's just, it works. Well, the reasons I've always been excited to have you on here aren't um, exactly because of your spokesperson thing. I mean, like, sure, I could be a spokesperson, but what I really like is, is your production. I mean, you at Sandwich, you guys have such a specific, unique, amazing voice. Um, there's a previous episode of this show where uh, Noah Kalina and I went on about how much we love your work for a while. And it's pretty easy to do because it, you guys have like a look you, and that's not, that's not always the case. It's hard to come by, you know, a lot of stuff that comes out in the commercial world feels kind of samey and um, is all, they, they all kind of want to push in certain directions at the same time and follow trends that I feel like you guys have set your own path that, feels great. Like I, I just really like the vibe. So I don't even know what I want to talk to you about today. Uh, I, I'd love you to even direct that uh -huh. a bit, but like, do we talk about production? Do we talk about storytelling? Do we talk about life on the internet? I don't, I don't know. What, what are you interested in this? Oh, moment? There's a ton, a ton of different direct, so many directions to go, but I love the, I love your context specifically. So I feel like we should uh, try to fall into, into that direction of what you do and where there's overlap for, in what I do. And by the way, I listened to the, the, the interview with Noah. Um, and like, I don't know if this is actually true, but in my memory, in my memory palace, this is true that I pulled over, uh, to the side of the road and just took a moment and wept <laughs> to myself because I had achieved oh, wow. all that I was hope possible in this. That and sounds I mean, <laughs> but I believe I, I love to, I love the interview. I loved the, that interview. Noah is so good as an interview. He's so bright and he's so, uh, f accessible as a human, you know, he's doesn't, he's not rarefied. He's not an asshole. He's, he's not an elitist. He's just like, I don't know. He says things that are absolutely my so core to, to, to my values, which is that, I don't know that sometimes it feels like it's too easy and that there's no magic tricks to doing it. I just do it the way I know how to do it. And so, uh, you know, it turns out that that's good. And I feel the same way in specifically in response to the question that you asked or the, the note that you just made about what it is about the work that we do at my company that is sort of identifiable or unique. And I just feel like it's the way that we make mistakes. That's what I've always thought is your tone or your voice is just the way that you do things wrong differently than the way that anybody else does things wrong. You know, you just break things along the way and you figure out what broken parts make something beautiful. I always heard guitarists say that, like when I was trying to learn to play guitar and I'd read 
I don't, you know, Guitar World magazine, whatever. And a lot of uh, musicians say that they're like the, the, you know, your flavor, your tone is in the the wrong notes that you play. Like that's how you define yourself. And I was like, sure. that's bullshit because I make so many mistakes and I sound terrible. So if it's all in the, I mean, I'm, what am I doing yeah. wrong? I'm making plenty, but. I think I understand that well, idea a little better now that I'm yeah, and it's a, it, it's a great counterpoint, but the the answer to that is you're making the same mistakes that a lot of people are making, and then so it's just that when you find your voice, you're making mistakes that don't that really only you've made yet, and it's because like everybody's brain works differently. We all have those weird margins um, that we fall into that nobody else has fallen into. I want to say a few nice things about Noah too, because he, um, I mean, to, to sort of return the favor, like, so all of the like greatness of him as a person is a hundred percent true. But I, since I knew him through the internet first, I so didn't expect it because first of all, his work is very elevated. Like it's very, um, polished and feels like it's from this other world and it's very beautiful and, you know, art, mm-hmm. artistic, like it feels like art and, He's very um, snarky on Twitter, to put it mildly. He has opinions. And I'm like, man, I'm very nervous to talk to him because like, I've looked up to him for so long. I respect his work so much. What if he is a total asshole and he just was the opposite? Like, he's such an amazing human. So that's always, I mean, that's the best kind of surprise. I, I really liked talking to him. And yeah, anyway, thanks for being a good guy, Noah. That's right. He's good. Yeah, he's good. He's good. Like, he's a good human. He's not just great. He's not just great. He's good. I love his work, too. But, like, yeah, good people work, too. Well, okay, for for me, so how do how can I make my work better? You have some of the things in your world are where I want to get to, like having a agency that's able to, you know, mostly, like, execute pretty big ideas. Um, you know, you're working with some dream clients. Um you're doing national work, you're doing, I think you've probably done a lot of work that you're really proud of. Uh, I've probably said it on the show before, but where I am right now is like my, my wife and I, you know, we do all these projects together and it's usually the two of us and then we'll hire a few assistants. Sometimes there's pre-production as well happening, but we're like, we're not quite, we're like one step away from that, 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 that bigger step of like making everything look like a national TV campaign. And I don't know, I'm always kind of like looking for the the tricks or secrets of like how, what, what will be the thing that gets us closer to that, to where I can look back at the work that we do and feel really good about it. Or do, do you like, do you look at your work and, and love it at the end of the day? Sometimes. Yeah. Like maybe like a, th- a third of the work that we do, I look back and I say, that was great. We really did something there. We worked really hard on it. It started with a good idea. We got it to a great place. Um, Probably a third there in the middle is we set out to do something for our client. We did it well. They were happy. We didn't, we didn't screw it up. And then a third of it is. (laughs) I'm I'm glad the check. (laughs) That's fine. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, You know, because clients are clients and clients um, collaborate with you creatively. And sometimes they're not, sometimes they're amazing creative collaborators and sometimes they're not. And so at the end of the day, the the result reflects all all of the collaboration. Not that I'm blaming clients, but. I mean, depends, depends on some clients you can blame sometimes. Sometimes it's my fault, <laughs> but there, I think that a lot of the time, like commercial work is sort of undervalued artistically. There is, there is so much really amazing work out there, like really creative, beautiful, um, sure. profound, like things that like touch you. There's okay. So an example of an ad that has always stuck with me is the Nick Drake Volkswagen convertible commercial from the pink moon, pink moon yeah, commercial. Sure. Like yeah. it's that, you know, I've gone back and I watched them like there's actually like now it doesn't actually feel as special because I think it was kind of absorbed into culture. Like it's that way of, of telling a story has become something we're a little more used to now. But at the moment, it's like, why do I want to cry after this like very simple little coming of age montage, just a few shots of kids driving in a car with a beautiful song. And then it affected me for 20 years. Um, but we, I think people that aren't creating commercials can forget that like this just is, 
it is making short films a lot of the time, you know, like, and there are those opportunities to do something that sort of transcends it and, and is, is a little bit more. Well, why the, I think the question is why was that spot revolutionary at the time or why were, was so much of the work that Volkswagen has done over the years, uh, revolutionary. And I think with that one specifically, it's because it, sh- it showed you or it told the story of how it feels to be in that car in that moment. Um, and, or how you feel, how you as a person feel, not what so much of advertising was before in various, you know, um, eras of, you know, style and creative trends, but which was like metaphor based. And this is what it's like. This is like almost with, uh, you know, like a, a homogenous gaze of like, this is what the world is like. This is in a novelistic sense. This is what the world is like. If you use Samsonite luggage, like that kind of thing, or this is, or if you drive a, like, if you drive in a Buick, it's like, it's like a Jaguar and you're it's sexy and there's a woman <laughs> there and she's sexy too. And it's all like this car that you're going to buy. And like, that's all bullshit mm-hmm. because not everybody feels that way, but it really dialed in to how this one character feels in this one car in this one moment and at the time it was new you know from my perspective if i don't know some some old timer in the ad industry might bring out a book of or a three quarters inch videotape full of uh you know (laughs) counter examples but i think that was pretty new and and the thing about you know generations after a great work is produced is that we all absorb that stuff and we just take it as red. We take it for granted in the language. It's, it's now in our water. And then we put it into all of the work that we do. So it doesn't seem as spectacular, uh, in retrospect, but it really was, it was revolutionary. Is there a commercial that has that feeling for you? Do you have your own pink moon commercial that hit you hard? Oh yeah. 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 Uh, the first iPod commercial first, what was the first Um, iPod? I mean, was it was it a dancing colors one? It was no. That was like that was after they went big on mm-hmm. brand. The first iPod commercial was they have to show you. They, there's a goal of the you know the the ambition of the spot is to show you what this device is, and show you how it works, and show you how good it feels all in the same thirty seconds. And it's this guy sitting in his home, and he plugs his FireWire 400 cable into the bottom of the uh, the thing because he's in iTunes, I think, on his you know, on his iMac and he downloads a song or he rips it from a CD, which we had back then. And then he plugs it into his iPod. The song loads in. It was, um, take California by propeller head or something like that. Um, very of the, of the moment (laughs) that song. And he take, he, he, he plugs it in. The song transfers over to his iPod, unplugs it, puts in his pocket and then starts dancing around his house to this song. And it's just so infectious, uh, this rhythm. I've always been a sucker for commercials where people dance. It's like, it can be for anything. It could be for like the GOP 2020. And if it's people <laughs> dancing, I'm like, oh, it's so great. What, how cute and fun. I'm saying, yeah. It's, it's yeah. funny because even now, I feel like Apple doesn't get the credit anymore of of leading the world in commercials like they they really were on top like everybody agreed they were on top of it for 20 years 15 years whatever and lately it's like oh yeah okay we all know apple makes good commercials but when you take a closer look at what's happening there's all these shorts that still come out now where apple's just killing it there are these just beautiful little moments that they're constantly putting out and i think sort of slip by because they're not they're not changing anything, but you can see that a filmmaker was given a chance to do something interesting and beautiful. Uh, I loved on Twitter the other day when I, Todd Vaziri added you and said, uh, there's that Apple commercial, the unboxing that Adam was a, a mood now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, but see that, 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 that is a perfect example of something. That's why I got into advertising. I did not have anything to do with that <laughs> but, uh, commercial, obviously. I mean, you know, sure. I, no, no, no. Like I would, I would so like <laughs> slobber all over it publicly if I did, but I didn't. But that is why I got into this is because I realized that in that very, very relatable um, phenomenon of being engaged with a thing like an object or product or, uh, you know, 
a, a thing that you can a, a, you can have in front of you and just reacting to it with something that's greater than yourself then like and i remember the the first experience that i had with this was i think like you know i was in college or something and i found my pen i realized that the pilot g2 pen is my favorite right. pen and like whatever it's a pen who this is like um somebody in 6th grade discovering they have a favorite band um but i but i realized that it that feeling of writing with it was special to me and then I just dreamed up, this is way before I started paying attention to spots, but I dreamed up like a spec spot um, that I would want to make where it's like a, a bank transaction and somebody, it's like in the middle of a, a tense conversation or a transaction and um, somebody's just about to to sign a contract that is going to be very meaningful to them or or stressful or whatever and somebody hands them a pen and they go to sign it and then they just stop. And you see that extreme close up of the pen writing and then just stop. And then you just, you cut to an ECU of their face and they go, Oh, <laughs> and then it would say, Oh, you know, in quotes, just, Oh, pilot. And, and that, it's very, it's very ad school, you know, it's very college mm-hmm. but it was like, it's that moment of somebody reacting to something that re- that is so relatable to everybody. Well, do um, ads because we all we all knew ex- the experience of having a product that we love. Do ads speak to you in a special way? Like, do you not? W- do you sometimes wish you were doing narrative or features or something? Or do you like connect to the idea of these short, these very short format little movies where you're trying to sell something? Or like, or do you would you like to do music videos? Like, do you love the format, or is this what you happen to be doing? No, I really love the format. Um, I went to film school and I went to film school because I loved movies and I really wanted to figure out as a young kid how movies were made mechanically and how we're able to extend our own, you know, central nervous system into the screen and, and sort of feel what the characters feel. But ultimately, that's not the discipline that I wanted to make, you know, like, you know, make my my livelihood. I discovered that the very, very short form of these little moments, I don't even want to call them stories because that seems trite, but these little moments where you see somebody engaging with either somebody else or with an idea basically that are very relatable and fun to reproduce for other people to see and to feel. Um, and that's why I really, that's why I got into it. When I discovered that it, that's something that I could do, like that I was reasonably okay at, then and because it um intersected with my fascination with tech and tools as well uh and specifically the tech of of tool of filmmaking then uh that's that's how i found myself in this overlap and it's um you know i listened to your matt workman episode from a few weeks back and you asked him a similar question about you know, he used to be a, a working, a full-time working DP. Does he want to go back and do that? Does he ever want to go back and make films again? And he's like, no, which is a beautiful, yeah, it was a huge change for him. Yeah. Right. It's a beautiful, honest answer. And I love to be able to that, express that same honesty with myself and to say that, no, I'm not a struggling, a frustrated filmmaker who just found himself in commercials. And I'm not even a frustrated commercial maker who found himself in the in the niche of of like explainer tech stuff. This is actually what I love doing, and if I can continue to to do this, then like I don't I I, I don't see any reason to, to to change it. So you asked you asked a question earlier on, and I didn't really answer it. But your answer was your question was like, "What can I do to make my work?" Oh yeah, let's get. Let's talk about me some more. That's more fun for me. <laughs> so I guess I asked, the, I asked you the question, what, what do you set out to do with every project that you take on? I mean, I, I know I, c- I could define one of my biggest problems as uh, scattering my attention far too much. So I don't have, like, this is where I want to be. I want to, I want to make big budget commercials or I want to have a big YouTube channel or I want to just be able to express myself creatively or take great photos. I, um, 
I'm, it's, it creates a challenge that it's like, well, no, I want to, I want to do all this stuff all at the same time. And that means that, um, I don't get better at all of them. I mean, the best cinematographers are doing it full time. So I know that's, uh, I'm, I'm handicapping myself a little bit by, uh, doing that. But, um, I mean, but, it, but aside from, um, di- diverting your attention, um, like if you have a project and you know, you have to complete that project, what is the, what is your, your top priority, your top mm. goal in mind with making that project? Uh, it's just making it look good to me. Like that. I think it looks nice and, and interesting. And, um, that's, uh, that's not always the, the right, the right thing. I know I've made some, some things ended up being a little more boring because I worried about the technical aspects more than I maybe should have the storytelling. So here's an example I'm running into right now. I've got, I've got a bigger camera. I finally have like a a cinema camera, right? I got a C200. I can shoot in raw, get lots of dynamic range, but it's kind of big and heavy. And all my gimbals take these lighter eight bit crappier cameras. So I end up in this choice where I'm like, you know, this moment probably calls for some action. Like I should, this should have some movement. I should be like running with the camera right now, but I really wanted to like to shoot it in raw and have all the dynamic range and make the colors look amazing. So I'm not going to go with the smaller camera. Yeah. And I know I've done that and it's been the wrong choice. So I have a, you know, basically a static shot that should have had some more energy to it. And I did that to have the, like the, the image quality, but I know that nobody else, I'm the only one watching it, seeing that element as being such a big priority. So that's an example of when I think I kind of go in the wrong direction. Well, can I, can I step in for a sec? Because I think that this plagues a lot of people who are technical, more technical filmmakers or, you know, DP directors or shooters or whatever, is that you know that you know how to make things technically correct. So therefore you prioritize making things too technically correct too highly. It's easier for me, who's not a DP, who's really just a creative person slash director sometimes uh, to discard a lot of that technical correctness and just allow it to be fucked up a little bit. And, and I, I, I think that that's, there's so much freedom in that. There's so much freedom in letting it get a little bit fucked up in order to, and then we, the end result is that you find that something was that much better because you, you just, you, you, you deprioritize the idea of making it perfect. Well, so even though you're not a, currently really a cinematographer, you don't do a lot of your own shooting other than this right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. You do, you, but, and you clearly love the tools as well. Like you, you like technology, you enjoy the uh, gadgets, uh, it seems. Um, do you like what? Yeah. So what's your relationship to that now that you're a little bit disconnected from that element of filmmaking? Like, do you, have an urge to pick up the camera and get hands on with it? Or are you just like, no, it's better if I let somebody else handle it. I, w- I would have a very hard time do- doing the handoff. Um, but it seems like we both love the tech. Right. Well, it's a dance, you know, it's a, for me, it's been, since I've been doing this for a while now, it's been a dance of like re and rediscovering the joy of the tools and then stepping away for a long, long time and then rediscovering. Um, I shot quote unquote, the first few videos that I made, including like the one that's the square launch video. Like I shot that because I didn't know how to hire a crew or an actor. (laughs) Um, and so it was me and my seven D that was my first real gear purchase and a a kit lens. And I rented a couple lights, such a good camera, right? It was great. And it revolutionized the work that I was doing and that so many people were doing. Um, but it allowed me to like to make something look better than a DV camera. So I, I, I took that with me in my backpack to San Francisco. I went to the camera place. I forget what, what camera place up there. And I rented a couple of lights just because I thought, Oh, I'm getting paid for this. I should have a couple of lights, no idea how to light something. So I just like set some, set some lights up and shot it. But then the, the, within like a couple of months, I had clients that were paying me enough that I really should be hiring somebody. So I got in touch with the first person I thought of whose work I really loved, who was a DP that I went to school to NYU with at the same time. We weren't really friends at the time, but I really know I loved her work. And it was Rachel Morrison who, who, you know, was the first woman nominated for the cinematography Oscar. And she and I became friends and she shot 
I mean, I always drop her name and it feels almost unfair because it's, it feels like I'm exploiting it and I'm getting too much out of this name. But the lesson here is that like, as soon as I got to offload the idea of shooting and using the tools myself, I got to, I got to hand them off to one of the world's most renowned cinematographers right, right now. Um, just by pure chance, <laughs> you know, that, that we happened yeah. to run in the same network. So that was, it was really easy for me to do. And then developing my creative networks along the way over the years, I just got, kept getting to work with all these insanely, um, uh, gifted people who knew the the tools way better than I ever could. And so I really let myself abandon the idea of learning the language of, of all of these tools, which was pretty great. But then cut to 10 years later, we're all at home by ourselves. My, I don't really have a camera to speak of, you know, yet at my company, we own a bunch of great gear and, like I should sort of learn how to use some of that gear and like pick it up and familiarize myself with it. And it turns out, oh yeah, the reason I got into this is because I was fascinated with the, the tools and the gear. And the reason somebody like me could start up a little video company by myself in 20, 2009 to 2010 was because the DSLR revolution came around and I'd set the 7D, the 5D or the 7D was suddenly accessible to me. And I could make 24 frames per second pretty pictures with shallow depth of field and they didn't look like garbage. And, um, and I knew how to color correct and edit. And so I just, I, I remembered the power of the tools and the innovation in the tools to dictate what is possible with the art form. And that's an incredible thing to remember. I love it. It's just so exciting what you can do for so much less budget too. Like if you're just getting into this and you go pick up one of the new black magic cameras, uh, and you're all of a sudden you're shooting raw and it looks like a big camera or even my, yeah, you know, like my C 200 that, you know, I was very excited about last year. The price dropped by like $2,000 after I bought it. And it's, um, it's like yeah. becoming an affordable camera and it's a proper cinema camera. You know, you really can shoot ju just about anything on it and it's going to cut between most other things. Um, that's amazing. They're unbelievable, but it's also like, yeah, the, the, the innovations that happen in between all of those big revolutions and camera tech, like right now I'm, sh I'm shooting this interview into a C300, which was the C300 that I, that, that the camera bought, uh, the, the company bought in, I don't know what, 2012 or something, whenever it came out, the Mark one, I think I got one of the first ones in LA because I was so clamoring for it because we needed to level up from, from our, uh, from our seven D or five D game. And, um, I was so obsessed with the gear. I remember whichever camera house it was that sold it to me, they put on a, like a tech demo day where they would have some representative from camera come and talk about all the cool features. And like me, like little, old, little dorky me brought my camera with me to this t demo thing at the camera house. Like I rolled it in my dumb think tank suitcase and brought my lenses like the first day of school with a backpack <laughs> on. And I thought that I was going to, I thought it was going to be like a yeah, lab. Yeah. No, it was just a sales right, convention right. basically. And I, I mean, it's worth, it's worth mentioning. I think Noah said the same when you interviewed him. There comes a point if you, if, if what you just want to do is make creative things and tell stories or whatever, there comes a point where the, the novelty of the tools loses its value, right? You have what you mm -hmm. need and now it's time to sort of jump off the, you know, spread your wings and fly and for, leave the gear world behind a yeah, little what bit. What can you do with it? Right. And it, it's a little disheartening if you sort of like go too deep in the, down the, the rabbit hole of the gear world. Um, where people just get so obsessive about, well, are you using this, you know, this thing or this thing? Um, be, and there's this like elitism around the, the specific gear choices. And then, and then you, re, but, but it's very clear that for people there forgot how to tell stories or forgot that it's real. That's the, that's the main point of what they're doing. It's not about shooting color charts. It's not, it's not about hiring a model from Craigslist and having them stand on a stage while you play with your lights and stuff. It's about making cool stuff. Like forget the There's gear. There's this really interesting relationship depending on how you go into it. Like thinking about some, 
friends that I have that wanted to get more into the traditional cinema path. So like Alan, for example, who was working with us for a few years, uh, Alan, if you're out there, you're amazing. And he wanted to make films. Like he wanted to like work on bigger sets uh, and you know, we're a much smaller uh, situation. People like him that I know will be, you know, they'll be working with an Alexa within a year or two of getting into it. Because even if you're just starting out as, you know, first a just general assistant, and then, you know, he was second AC and now he's first AC, uh, you know, it means he gets to work with the best camera. Uh, you know, I'm sure like he's, he's been shooting with a, an Alexa LF in the, which I'm not, I can't even dream of touching. Mm -hmm. And that's where the big difference comes in. So for me, I like value these upgrades so much because I'm putting all of my own money into it. So picking up a C200 for me, like yeah. I just, like I wanted to sleep with it next to me on my pillow. Like I want to have it with me everywhere I go. <laughs> There's like this really direct connection because you had to, you know, work so hard for every little moment of it. And same for, you know, I, I don't want to forget about earlier times for me as well. Like with the first 5D, you know, the kit that I bought, I probably spent about 5,000 Canadian dollars on it, which was an unimaginable amount of money to me at the time. Like that was, that was all the money in the world, you know? And, and, it, and basically we got, we, yeah. that was what I did with the bonus. When I stock sold to, to Getty, we got these little, everybody got a little bonus. I'm like, I'm going to buy a real camera. And the closeness that I felt emotionally to it was kind of profound because it was so hard earned and there so i see a different relationship with gear for people that jump in to a you know more of a traditional rental situation where it's like yeah the camera's already there and it's going to be it's going to be an alexa or a red and that's just a given and don't even worry that other cameras exist out there because that's not what you're going to be using um and there can be some advantages to that because then you're you're sort you can skip all of the gear obsession that I'm struggling with. And you can just be like, look, we've got, it's taken care of. The gear is handled. It is already here on set. Now let's just do something with it. Um, whereas, you know, me, I'm still like, I'll spend all this so much time ahead of time thinking about all the little details of how it's going to work. And I don't, but, but I, I also like that closeness that I have to the gear. Like that's the, there is a good part to it too. Oh yeah, it's a relationship. And I and I remember you said something on one one of the episodes recently that was about like during it might have been one with Justine. Forgive me if I misremember, but you said something about during this time uh you sort of rediscover the importance of the gear you own. It's yeah. not just about the gear you want exactly, yeah. anymore. So that's that's very powerful. You know, it's 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 like what can I do? We're we're all in this uh, mode of scarcity. To, you know, with yeah, I mean, Amazon time. makes it so that we don't necessarily <laughs> have to be forced into that yeah. mode. I mean, I've built up my home kit more n more in this last you know month than I have in the in the last five years, I think, just so I can you know have some light and stuff uh, and some sound because it was it's funny how long it took us for that at my company specifically for that notion to kick in that if we just use the default things on our, on the gear that we own, if we just use the MacBook camera uh, and the, you know, AirPod mics and stuff that we're not actually representing ourselves that way, uh, that, that great. I think it was Matt, um, Matt Mullenwig. Is that, uh, is that the WordPress guy? Uh, he was on, name, that uh, is a name that sounds he was familiar. On a pod. I don't remember which one what his name is though. Yeah. He was on, he was on a podcast I, I listened to and he was talking about that idea is. Cause they're all work from home. WordPress is like a hundred percent dispersed work environment and always has been right. Right. And he was talking about, he was talking about this idea that that is, you know, maybe they're, they're not making the decision of what outfit they wear to work. You know, they're, they, that's not how they choose to represent themselves or the qualitative decisions they can make to represent themselves. They're thinking about how how do they look and sound when they mm -hmm. tell a teleconference remotely, and so that they can make these different little decisions, like using the crisp plug, you know, crisp AI to to remove some of the noise in their in their audio and stuff like that. That or you know, sit by a window if you don't have a light, that kind of thing. And it's it's all it's all very cool, and it all just sparked all this gear fascination that had really been dormant for me for a long time. And I remember, I mean, like just a second. I dug, I dug this out of the oh, basement. Is that your new webcam? 
No, <laughs> yeah. I saw that. I saw that make a cameo in your uh, Slack video. Oh yeah, no, that was a VHS cam. Oh, that was different. Okay, that was that was an amazing moment, by the way. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was an Easter egg. I'm glad. I'm glad people caught it. But um, this is my. This is the eight. The video eight handy cam that was gifted to me for eighth grade graduation that I ended up sort of like just teaching myself a lot of the language of of editing and and effects and all these things like this was a tool that I wanted to sleep with when I was in a, you know, when I was 13 years old, uh, this was my everything. If anyone listening is wondering what Adam is showing, it's because you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel yet. And I know almost <laughs> none of you have, cause the numbers are way out of whack. So go watch the video. Cause uh, we actually put effort into it this time, but I had that, I had that relationship, except it was, it was more unhealthy cause it was with my parents camcorder and I ended up taking it apart. I don't know why I would have, possibly unscrewed machine screws because you loved a it camera so much. but i'm like what's in here <laughs> that was such a like, why I why did, did i do too. that didn't there's nothing to gain but you wanted to find its soul yeah. tyler <laughs> actually yeah that, i guess that actually kind of was it that's very true and i, I guess i did because you know i've i've been uh soul partnered to cameras ever since um uh, yeah. Well, you know, the gear, not to get philosophical, but the gear has a soul. That's why we love it. That's why you make sh shows about it. That's why I make commercials about it. You know, it, it, it does have humanity because it's, this is the dumbest thing I'm going to say all week, but you know, it's made in the image of the people who made it, you know, they made it for themselves and for us and it, and it reflects humanity and that's why it's so good. That's why the best tools are that good is because they they live and breathe. Yeah. And that's okay. You know, if that's okay to try to open it up, you're essentially that 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 camera's psychologist. Well, I like I like to hear you say it's okay cuz I think it's okay too. I yeah, this is a this is a position I try to push off and is that there's a lot of voices saying the gear doesn't matter, don't worry about it. You can create anything you want with the camera that you have with you. The best camera is the one in your pocket and I know why people say that, and sometimes it's sometimes it's absolutely true, but it's not always true. And sometimes it's, you know, b better things are better, and, and it's worth it's worth loving them and obsessing over them. I mean, it's the same reason people fall in love with wristwatches or their daily carry, or you know, buy fancy pocket knives or what. I mean, there are beautiful objects out there, and a lot of it is. A lot of it that like that is part of our modern art, right? Like that's where a lot of humanity's design energy goes is to consumer products. There's um, I mean, there's plenty of people also making paintings and music and film, but we shouldn't discount this idea of like something that's actually practical and um, might be very close to you. I mean, th this is why I care about iPhones. Like I, the thing or phones, I guess, I don't know. I'm, I'm using iPhones, but whatever phone it is, I get excited about the next one because it's such a close, it's such a profound part of your daily life, whether you want to admit that you're a little addicted to it or not, whether you have a healthy relationship with your phone or not, it, the design changes of it really do affect how you go about your life day to day. AirPods, you know, such a, a perfect example of like, it really changes the uh, the you know the amount of podcasts I listen to it changes my relationship with the news or to um, how I leave my phone behind a lot more often like it, I'll leave it across the house and just kind of wander around. There's just all these little things that like your day and your life do become shaped by what can seem like minor technology changes, and then all of a sudden you realize like oh wait I'm like my, all my behavior is shifting because Apple told me something would come in the next keynote. But. Yeah, no, I, I love the gear. That's why I got into this. That's why I made friends with John Gruber who obsesses about the gear. Like that's why I became in the, you know, integrated in this new, this community that was outside my community, but it was people who just absolutely fixated on the details of, of the, the design of these products. What are some things you actually really like right now? Let's just talk about gear for a second. What are you using lately that has gotten you excited? Right. No, like one of my favorite non-production things or non-computer things is my, um, my Ember mug. Uh, do you know what that is? I've seen that at like the bookstore or Starbucks or something. A couple of years ago, they were selling a lot of them at Starbucks. I don't know if they still are. And I approached them to 
try to make commercials for them, which I don't really, I don't like cold call very often to try to like drum up work. And when I do, it's because it means something to me and they sort of like, you know, they, they, they rejected my advances. So like, I don't even want to, can you sell me on it right now? Because looking at them, I'm always like, Oh, I probably need this in my life. But right. Okay. So just, just so people know factually, informationally, it's a mug that has its own heating element in it. It connects to your smartphone. Um, you set your ideal temperature of your beverage and when you pour it, your beverage in there, it'll just keep it at that temperature that you prefer. Right. It sounds like, Oh, that's dumb. It sounds like, it sounds like the, the juice arrow or whatever. It just sounds like some gimmick. <laughs> well, that, okay. But I'll say, you know, I microwave my coffee about three times before I finish a cup. That happens to me at least five days a week. So, <laughs> okay. So imagine the pleasure and the joy that you experience when you have poured yourself a coffee. It's too hot. Oh no, I can't drink that. I'll scald my mm-hmm, lips. Mm-hmm. You step away, you go check the news on, on your phone or whatever. You come back five minutes later. Oh, that's really good. Do I want to drink the whole thing now because it's the perfect temperature? No, I'm just going to sip it. I'll put it there. I go away for 40 minutes. I come back. It's still at that temperature. You drink it. You're like, what the hell just happened? You're describing my every single what? day. But it's the perfect temperature. You know, you you still, you pick it up and it's like, remember that the feeling, the, the G2, the pilot pen um, <laughs> moment that I described? It's that every time you drink mm. a cup of coffee because you go to pick it up and it's, Oh, that's delightful. That's the exact temperature I wanted. And I made this cup of coffee an hour. I'm ago. adding one to my Amazon wish list right now. They're they're affordable. I gave everybody in my family one for Christmas that year and the, and it, I was the hero of Christmas. Oh. Everybody loves them. Yeah, I've got I mean, I just got the magic keyboard for the iPad. That's pretty great. <laughs> I've I've wanted to make a video about this for a while, but it almost fe- feels like it'd become like the 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 anthem for Apple fanboys, but I kind of want to talk about why Apple which is a dumb question because like, okay, there's, a, you know, people have, people have gone on about it for hours, but I always thought it'd be interesting to have like, let's just get all these ideas together in some somewhat well-produced YouTube video at some point of like, why is it that we don't choose a cheaper PC that can render our videos out at the same speed? Why do we get excited about, you know, AirPods when there's, you know, there's Raycon and all these other devices that can effectively do the same thing and they're going to cost us less money and you could be happy with them. What, how did Apple end up being yeah. a bit of a center of your technical interests or tech interests? I ha- I was on a call with a client uh, yesterday and I brought this up because they're talking about some appliance, right? It's a big, big brand name that I'm trying to work with. They, they were talking about an appliance with this one specific feature that they're trying to sell a lot you know they're using this as sort of a halo effect for the for the appliance and just uh um, on the call i i thought of it as like just sort of the tesla the the tesla um model of product making where it's a it's all those features on the edge of the product that make it so delightful that make somebody stop and notice oh the doors open like that or the you know, on the first, on the Model S, the the handles come out when you approach the car. It's like any other car manufacturer would have said, no, that's dumb. People don't buy cars for the door handles. They they buy cars for the fine, the rich Corinthian leather or, or whatever it is, yeah. you know, they, they, and uh, so I feel like test the Tesla model is essentially the Apple model, which says that people fall in love with the soul, the humanity of a product because they find a character quality of that product that reminds them of their own humanity. You know, we, we fall in love with people because they have, Oh God, I can't believe I'm about to say this. People have features that we <laughs> like and we respond to. I love this. This is like, first of all, first we're over romanticizing the gadgets and then we're uh, turning humans into, into gadgets themselves too. It's a, it's a helpful analogy though. I mean, I get it. But just circling back to where we came from at the beginning of this conversation, you mentioned like the whole idea, like we're, we're, I, me being a proto influencer and sort of like there's this whole world now of, of, uh, you know, of, of, of people who have all, make all this content about gear. And I think that the difference is that when I make something, when, when my company makes something about a piece of gear, we're not just saying, hey, guys, 
Um, we're going to run through some of the the features and specs of this piece of gear. Like my job is to get overwhelmingly excited uh, and show how I've fallen in love with the thing. And I think that that you can't do that every single time. There's a premium mm-hmm. to that, right? Otherwise it loses its value. So I think that that's, that's probably where I, where I differ from the, like the influencer approach. I don't know. Is there, do you ever consider writing or making content around that's where, where you play yourself, I guess, because you do it as a guest on other people's shows. You're doing it right now. You're, you do it on the talk show. Yeah. But in, I think kind of all the content you create, you're a, you know, a character of yourself. You are, you're you, but in, in character. Um, I don't know. Do you, do you have, actually, do you even yeah. have anywhere where you're just the, the, the normal Adam the, the whole time? Not really. No, I would love to though. I would love to just be myself and do this. Like, you know, like I, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you do people... in regular life day to day, but well, no, no, I mean, nobody gives a shit what I say <laughs> at work. They're, they're all sick of me. Yeah. No, but like when I do my, 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 sh- the show with Scott and Merlin, I'm just there to like as a backdrop and they, they do all the funny stuff. But like, I, I really love just having conversations like this or showing people gear like I did it once. I did um, one of my other favorite products is the Noon Switch. Like it's there. Um, I'll just pull it out. Uh, so it's I'm I'm not sure if you can see, but this is a light switch with a with an OL, o, OLED screen, and you can swipe it and tap it. And to, right now it just says click director into base because it it's not in the wall. But each one of these is like a, a mobile device. Um, and you install them, you wire them into your home, just like a normal light switch, except that you can use them to set scenes and control your lighting and um, control everything from your phone, et cetera, et cetera. And so we did some client work for them. And then when I was, when we moved into this house and it was time to sort of upgrade the the electrical, I went back to noon and I said, Hey, is there friends and family? Cause these things are real expensive. They're not as expensive as your traditional, like hundred thousand, you know, hire the, the whole crew of specialized. Right. Custom, Everything's custom. Bespoke, yeah. Whatever's, but yeah, yeah. This is like sort of a turnkey solution, but they're pretty, they're still pretty expensive. So I, I asked them if there was a discount and they said, can you make us a YouTube video where you show that we'll install them in your home. And can you make us a YouTube video where you demonstrate them and you show your enormous fan base? I do not have an enormous <laughs> fan base. I didn't even have really a YouTube channel to speak of. So I feel like I sort of hoodwinked them a little bit because I was like, yeah, I'll do that. My fans are going to love well, this. Well, look, the fans of this and, show are, um, so you're, you're, you can borrow my uh, borrow my <laughs> fan bandwidth for uh, to look, fulfill your contractual obligations. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's really nice. Thank you. Um, so we... We made like a little YouTube video. I even hired nobody at Sandwich helped with it. No, one, our, our one of our junior editors cut it together, and I hired a friend to like shoot the sort of um, EPK style. You know, hey guys, I'm in my house. Let's let's take a look at all my stuff. It was very cribs. You know, it was very MTV <laughs> cribs. And so we did like a little. We even did a little meta cribs humor in there. Um, but like it came together. I. The video was fine. Probably th- three or four people saw it. I looked terrible in it. I didn't realize that if you're a YouTube personality, you should put a little bit of care into like there was no hair and makeup person there. I didn't like I it was just I was a hot mess. And so I probably I sent it to them. I sent sent it to noon and they were probably like, Yeesh, what did we <laughs> We made a huge whoops. Take. There's a, there's a lot of times that I sit down in front of my main camera and realize only after I'm done that I have a bunch of fluff in my beard. Like, uh, my, when our cat sleeps oh, yeah, on a bed, I'll get these little, uh, you know, fluffs. And then at the end I'm like, oops, I guess that's going in. Cause I don't want to re-record it. But yeah, it's true. You gotta be your own hair and makeup. Right. It's, uh, I'm not very good at it to be honest, but there was, there's one, I'm sure I've mentioned it before, but there's one time that, 
uh, it was in the winter and I was wearing like a down jacket and one of the white feathers had gotten stuck on the side of my head. And fortunately you can only see it if I turned. So I edited the whole video so that I'm only using shots where I'm looking directly forward at the camera. So go watch all my YouTube videos <laughs> and try to spot which one I never turned to the side. <laughs> yeah. You, I mean, you'd be amazed at some of the stuff that I've done out of my, for vanity, like the money that I've spent for vanity when I've been on camera, like in a, in a thing, like we did some serious digital cosmetics on some of those true car those true car things. There was one, there was one campaign I did. Oh, this was tragic. But, um, I had like a, I went to the eye doctor. I had like a issue with my, my retina and I went to the world's worst eye doctor. Oof. Cause he was in my neighborhood near work. <laughs> okay. And like in the middle of getting an injection in my eye, no, I heard no, a loud no, click. No. And then he goes, Oh, that wasn't supposed mm. to happen. And long story short, I ended up with half of my mm -mm. sclera, my white, mm -mm. the white part of my eye, covered in blood. And I was supposed to go on camera to, to do a national commercial, like oh, five days no. later. Which you know, so I go. At that point, many hundreds of thousands of dollars have been spent, and there's no turning back. And we just convinced the client, no, we can, we can take, we can work with this. Don't worry, <laughs> and. Uh, so it's me uh -huh. all day on camera for three days with a, half of, of, of my eye is completely bloody, like a ho disgusting horror movie. Uh -huh. And then we have to go take the dailies and hand them over to a, a visual effects house no. to clean up uh -huh. my eye. And most of it is okay. Most of it is okay. There are a couple of shots that are absolutely I'm terrible. imagining it's like Superman's lips where they removed the mustache. You're, uh, you've are you got like Mad-Eye Moody drifting off to one side and it's the wrong color or something. <laughs> right. right. But have you ever seen the movie Top Secret? Do you remember I that do. movie? Um, it's like a, it's a World War II spoof um, from the makers of Airplane and Naked Gun. Anyway, there's this one whole scene where they go to visit the library, a library, and there's this old man who's the librarian and he's at the beginning of the scene. First of all, they shoot the whole scene backwards and then they play it in reverse so that it sounds like everybody's talking Swedish. Um, mm -hmm. But at the beginning of the scene, the old man is is, re is inspecting an, an uh, you know a, uh, an old book, an antique book, and he comes up to when they walk in, and he's got his magnifying glass up to his eye. So one of his eyes is enormous, and then it's a visual gag. You know, it's a slapstick movie. So. Um, they they keep talking and he takes the magnifying glass away and he's just got one enormous <laughs> eye still. And that's that it's one of the best cinematic visual jokes ever in any movie. Ever. I mean, did you consider just writing it in as a gag so that uh, there's like a joke about somebody farting on your pillow or. Uh, at... <laughs> yeah. Just a button at the end of a national <laughs> campaign for or a spot yeah. for a telecom. Hey, why is your all, why is your eye look all <laughs> fucked up? Cut to black. <laughs> Oh man. I, so I, well, I, I worry about this in much, much smaller scale doing YouTube videos where I'm like, every time I get my hair cut or lately cut my own hair, I'm like, man, if I screw this up, this is going to suck for the next few videos. <laughs> but like, there's always this little bit of dread. It's funny that to when you're directing and you, and you care about like, you notice the details of like hair and you're of course paying attention to the performances, but, but you see, but like, okay, can we just take that one piece of bang and just like sweep it gently? I'm so the, surprised. Every time I see in a movie, this happens often in big budget movies that one hair is flying out to who knows yeah. where. And there's like a little yeah. dandruff on the shoulder and who, <laughs> who left that there? I mean, we have the technology. I don't have right. to be the one to notice this. Come on guys. Ha uh, hair and makeup. Can we get last looks? And then they stay flying in and they come and then they spend like four minutes with their spray and their, their brush just getting that fly away to go away while like 40 people stand around watching them take a take a hair and i think that the reason that kind of stuff happens sometimes is because it was like take 19 and everybody was so tired and the hair was perfect <laughs> on the first 18 yeah, takes that they yeah. ended up using Never the other use the last one what what do you what are you up to um what are you up to how are you making commercials right now you guys are more or less working from home. I take it. I don't know to what extent, but what is work like for you right now? Right. Um, well, we did this one, we did this big project for big project for us for Slack. It was, um, 
it was it was it was amazing. Thank you, thank you. It was very thank good. You. When an idea comes together, you know. Um, but really, the first day of that that we realized we were going to have to not come into the office, and it, at that time it was like, okay, we're going to take a week away from the office, and then everything should probably smooth over. But it was clear that wasn't happening. And so I had this idea, like, we're going to be working from home. We're going to be relying on Slack to work from home. Why don't we make a video about that? Um, we'll make it a small one. You know, like that, that was my thought process. We'll make it a small one with just a, as a small crew instead of a big crew. So I pitched it to Slack and they, they liked the idea and they signed off on it. But by the time that it was greenlit, the, the option to make it with a small crew was no longer possible. Everything, everything was like, wash your hands for 40 minutes at a time. Right. Uh, don't certainly don't share gear. So what we did instead was we put together this very small package of gear. Again, like it reminded me of my fascination with the tools we put together with this small production package of, of camera or black magic pocket cinema six K um, our sound package, uh, a couple of light, light mats. I saw that you guys did the behind the scenes in that breakdown of the package, by the way, is a great, like if anybody's yeah. looking for a package, that is a, a wonderful one. Like light mats are so amazing. Uh, the black magic stuff, all of it, like that kit could take you so far and looking at the work you guys did in this commercial, like you would never spot that it wasn't the most expensive, biggest setup because it looks pretty legit. Right. Thank you. Uh, that, that means that's a great compliment. And it's, uh, we had, you know, our DP Lowell Meyer, who was, DPing remotely. I was directing remotely over Zoom and we we really just relied on all the telepresence tools that we had at our disposal. And we made sure that everybody in the video who's going to be shooting themselves was educated enough to use the tools and felt comfortable and had somebody, you know, their domestic partner on set with them to help them move the stuff around and make sure that you're getting audio levels and that the, you know, shots in focus and things like that. And it was this thing like, it was just, could we do this? Will this work? Yes, it can work. Yes, we did it. It turned out good. Oh my God. We, we figured out how to sort of like make something during this time. We just made another one, the same model for a different startup. Um, uh, and it went well. And the, you know, the, the video is cool. And like, we, we basically like formalized this into a package that we call lunchbox and, uh, it, it allows us more than anything. It just allows us to present this as an option for our clients who are saying, when are you going to be able to shoot again? You know, when is Hollywood ready again? And you know, the, 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 the answer that we've had internally for the last couple of months has been, we don't know. And it's going to, it could be like maybe not till September when people crews are getting together again. What's weird to me is that the County of LA is saying that production crews are supposed to be right, shooting right now today. Yeah, like there's crazy. Yeah. Like, Hey everybody get back to business. <laughs> Everything's back to normal. We're talking about how to spin back up and all of the safety measures. And we're, you know, we're going to do it, but we're going to be very, 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 very safe about mm -hmm. it. What it's forced us to reckon with is that we can, I mean, like not even reckon it with, but realize is that we can, we can be efficient with when, when, when life forces you into these constraints, you figure out how to do it. And that's what, what did, what did you actually I mean, do for, that's, that's for monitoring things remotely? Did you just like point an iPhone at the back of a camera or did you have something more? Well, yes, that is like the, that's the down and dirty solution. That's like solution number one. And then solution number two is we use the, you know, OBS. Um, we basically go HDMI out of the camera through a, converter to get it to USB into the MacBook Pro. Mm -hmm. you use the software OBS. So you can monitor the real be able to live product, yeah. live stream. That's yeah. so cool. <laughs> exactly. I mean that we've 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 now ordered a an a Blackmagic ATEM Mini Pro, but it, there those things are back ordered to hell, so we'll never know when that's going to come in, but we've been renting them in the meantime. Well, so I'll, I'll take that as an opening to talk about that. I have one in front of me right now that yeah, was back ordered forever. It took me almost two months for it to get here, but I'm touching it right now. Oh and my it gosh. feels, it's really nice. <laughs> I, I like this thing. I can finally record my PlayStation, do, which I could never do before. Are you able to um, do any live switching for us right now? Or is that, is that, yeah, listen to it, listen to it. Borked right now. 
No, I mean, well, so it's it's fake right now. I did. <laughs> I got to find a way. The, the dream part of why I want to have this is so I could do. I could live switch this podcast and not edit it later. But then I have to set things up in a very specific yeah. way, and if I screw it up, it's in there. But it might be worth it for the amount less. Like it would be. It'd be infinite less time. Like I'd be done editing when the show was over, which would be kind of amazing. So I don't know. I'm gonna try to figure out a way to do that. Um, if nothing else, I want to use it to do better multi-track recording for YouTube videos. So that, for example, when I have like a top-down shot showing a product in my hands, um, that I could live switch, right? So I could be on, okay, camera one, and here I am talking about the, the like I'm just talking head, and then I pause and I go to camera two, and then I start recording the other one. So in the end, I only have one track, and it's already cut between the cameras when I want them to, so that I don't have to create a multi-track file in post and then you know have that extra storage and computer taxation and like it you know it's it slows things down a lot to actually have multiple tracks later so uh, i don't know i think there's a lot of little ways that i'm going to use it but this is, i can't believe how cheap this piece of super powerful gear is like it's a proper tv switcher and it was less than a thousand bucks yeah it's really awesome i i recent just last week i i have this friend charles foreman who on Twitter all the time, he'll, he'll, he'll be like, Hey, who wants to get on a call and just talk about make, making stories. And, uh, last week I was, I bit and we, we got on a zoom call, the two of us. And then a, another filmmaker friend in Delaware who owns a, a video company, Zach Phillips. And the three of us were on a zoom call for about 90 minutes. And they put me to shame with their gear setup. Like they, Zach was shooting through, um, a mirrorless Panasonic, real nice. Um, his lighting was gorgeous and soft, and um, and then uh, both of the Charles, the both of them were shooting into a teleprompter rig like this, a beam splitter, so that they're looking straight into the lens as they're talking to me, which is a game changer. I did it just because they gave me the idea, and um, but Charles blew us out of the water because he had his camera, his webcam essentially on a, on a, an automatic glider, like, or a, mm. a, sorry, a slider. I was like thinking a, about that today. I was like, man, I wish I had one of those. Cause I would use it right now. Oh, totally. So it was just throughout the call. It's just slowly <laughs> sliding back and forth, keeping things yeah. interesting, yeah. making it dynamic. Charles has this company called wonder unit and, and all of he, all he does all day long is he's like Tony Stark for movie tools. And he just dreams up interesting ways of telling stories in the future. I'm curious what will become the, the normal high production thing that, that everybody goes out and buys a thing to do what we're doing right now. Cause it's not going to be setting up a C 300 and a teleprompter and, you know, like big lights or light mats, or whatever, but there's got, there is room right now for like, somebody's going to come in and make the product that it's kind of all in one, you know, maybe there's like a webcam and a ring light and a proper mic or something, but the, I think there's yeah. gotta be something like the Jetsons video telephone that people start installing so that they don't look so terrible. Cause right now, right now people look awful in most video conferences and they, they don't really don't <laughs> yeah. need to. Um, I, st I still can't believe how bad the late night shows let themselves look until they got, you know, the, the crew sent right. them some real gear, but for a while it was pretty yeah, some of them are still pretty bad, but I don't know. I think that it's always too it's it's always going to be too hard. And I'm a futurist, but I think it's always going to be too hard to make traditional cinematic images with three point lighting and all this. I don't I don't think there's, and I think that the challenge or this the problem is too niche niche to be solved in a ma in a major consumer level. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's all you know. I think it's going to going to be easier. And I think like I had the joy of discovering led lights, which I hadn't really paid attention to ever because back when I was in short pants and trying to like buy the cheapest lighting kit on Amazon, I got those fluorescent, you know, <laughs> CFL bulbs and, you know, umbrella, like just crap, you know, stuff that went into the closet and never yeah, came out. Bright green or deep magenta. <laughs> right. And led, like the ones that, you know, LEDs that you can switch between, you know, you can, you can change the color temperature and, and dim it with your phone. It's, it's incredible. That's been 
my joy of discovery in the gear sense for in the last couple of I'm weeks. using a, I actually never have had proper RGB LEDs around and I'm using one for the first time today for my uh, hair light. It's a, a Lupo and it, yeah. It's really nice. What is that? Well, it's a, it's a, wait, let me get the model number. I can't see the model number. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a, it's the Lupo <laughs> RGB, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I just like turn some dials and can, yeah. uh, change the colors and this, I mean, oh yeah. And so really amazing one that's coming out too is like uh, Aperture has basically a sky panel coming out. That'll be, I think it was like yeah. 1500 bucks or something. Like it was, I, don't quote me on the price. I forget, really? but it was cheap. It was way too cheap. And it really looks like a full featured, you know, RGB. How do you, what's the double white, like WWRGB, whatever, like a proper panel mm -hmm. that can cover the full spectrum and have super high quality, clean, uh, either you know basically a white output or a 5600 output or it can go deep red or deep blue or whatever you need and you're spending virtually yeah. nothing on it i mean yeah the kits that we're gonna be able to put together in just like a couple more years i just i i don't even know i i don't have any more room in my studio for more gear i don't know how i'm gonna how i'm gonna fit all this stuff but it's it's looking good it's pretty awesome. I like that. I like that it just allows people to do this and like essentially be their own broadcasters. I mean, it's such a trite sort of like I'm 42. So like, I still think of things in terms of broadcasting, yeah. <laughs> you know, which is so dumb, but it's very cool. I love you're, it. You're at this really, you're like in between internet and broadcast world. Like you've very much been a part yeah. of both cultures in a way that most people how are, are one or the other right like their their career was built up either in the old world or the new and you're totally living in both of them in an interesting way do you like i don't know i just i i kind of already asked you this question i just would love to see you do more internet stuff where you where you be yourself so i was gonna i don't know some someday we'll see we'll see the real adam someday if i ever do i will need the help of friends it'll be on tiktok <laughs> yeah i should make sure everybody knows that you did a relaunch you look nice today california king so if anybody hasn't seen it um go check it out on YouTube because it's, there are videos now just like there are of this. And if you haven't seen sandwich, formerly sandwich video now sandwich, <laughs> um, also go check that out. Cause Adam does infinite amounts of crazy work and you should go, Oh no, wait, I was about to say goodbye, but I want to talk to you about one last thing you did videos recently, maybe last year of the 1000, 10,000 and hundred thousand dollar video production examples. Like what do you get right. for spending that kind of money? And it was goddamn genius. It was such a great idea. I I know I talked about it on this show as soon as it came out and sent it to all of my friends because I'm like, yeah, this needs to be shown. And I just want to say what what that misrepresents if you send those videos to an actual client, let's say somebody that's looking to hire a video production agency. You guys did a great job, but what it'll confuse people is that $1,000 video is way too good because most people are not going to get that for $1,000, <laughs> both in terms of, you know, you're using cheap technology, but you guys have great writers. The performances are fantastic. The compositions make sense and are clever. And like, it's using the budget in a much, much more interesting way than a lot of people are really going to find for $1,000. So anybody out there, don't get your hopes up that much. You're, you're not going to get something that good if you only spend a thousand bucks, but, um, Overall, I mean, yeah, it was that was a really great idea. Well, all credit for the idea goes to um, the Wistia crew, for, to Chris Levine and Dan Mills, and uh, they just came to us. They knew they had this product soapbox, and they knew that they wanted to come work with Sandwich to make a video to promote it. We got on the phone with them, and they said, "So we had a couple of ideas. Here's one idea. Here's another idea," and they said we'll hire you to make three different commercials with three different budget levels. Um, would this be interesting at all to you? And I, it just blew my mind. I was like, yes, that one, that is the challenge mm -hmm. that I've wanted to accept for like my entire creative career to do alternate variations of a thing, given different constraints and different contexts, different prompts. Um, it was such a fun challenge. I mean, I wish I, pe I wish that people paid, a little less attention attention to the economics of it as right. though they yeah, were yeah, yeah. The, the actual, actual numbers are cor cor mm -hmm. correlative you know yeah um because the economics of it were were fantasy they were purely fictional um and the joke of the $100,000 one was that it was supposed to be a bad version of the $10,000 <laughs> one because you had too much money yeah. <laughs> uh and you you know we had so many it was we, 
we had so many clients for the next year approaching us and saying, hello, we saw your soapbox commercials. We would like the $10,000 one, please. When can you start? Mm-hmm. And it was like so many uncomfortable conversations <laughs> to say, actually, the, the the purpose of that project was more educational. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I mean, all credit goes to the Wistia crew. All credit goes to Claude, the director and star of those. Um, but speaking of Chris, by the way, Chris Levine at Wistia, he makes this really fun series uh, called uh, Out of Office Hours. Out of Office Hours. Out of, in parentheses. And it's him basically doing the, the ATEM Mini Pro, or I think he has a mini, switching and interviewing people live, like, you know, live streaming show and mixing sources. And he's got, he's, he even cuts to a, a VHS player playing Jurassic Park. <laughs> The I think I just watched Jurassic this. Park on VHS. It's super good and it's very informative too. I watched it after I we had already put out our our Slack one about you know the 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 documentary about mm-hmm. doing remote production and it turned out he had already been doing these shows for like a month asking you know creators how are they doing things remotely how are they setting up their studios how do you you know he he gets a gaffer on to talk about what's something that you can do cheaply to make your space you know, light your space better. He taught, he interviewed the two brothers who edit SNL and talked to them about what it was like to cut three episodes of one of America, you know, one of the world's most renowned comedy shows on their MacBooks, you know, from their parents' house in long Island as, you know, chugging away without any processors. And, uh, He's Chris is just a charming, delightful guy, and I think Gear Nerds especially will really like his, seeing his. I setup. have to see that. That sounds right up my alley. I still want to hear a little more from you about the uh, Wistia piece, though. Of what, like, what would you say some yeah. of the take homes from that should be then, when a client is deciding to set a small, medium, and large budget? What's the What's the real conversation about how that situation looks? Um you know, keeping things to a smaller budget are questions and dis- a process of decisions to make on what you're sacrificing and where you're compromising. And we wa- I think that the purpose of this series from an educational perspective was really to let people in on some of that decision-making process that if you have, you know, we called it a hundred thousand dollars, but if you have big budget and which is relative then it means you can have this piece of gear, this Fisher dolly, this piece of music, you know, this composer, um, instead of having to license the cheapest, you know, stock track. Um, and it's for somebody who's really interested in making videos at whatever level to know what are these decisions? What are the things you can have for your money and what can't you have? And how do they inform the creative decisions? Of course, we just really didn't include the creative into the process of it because our, our goal was the same no matter what, which was pretty self-promotional um, from our side in the, in the project, which is that we're sandwiched and we're creative. And we make funny yeah. stuff no matter what, you know, what amount of money we have.